This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. Scientists have issued a new warning that greenhouse gas emissions from thawing permafrost in the north could be twice what we thought as the world warms. Scientist Mary Turesky is the lead author of the article in the journal Nature. Permafrost collapse is accelerating carbon release, as published April 30, 2019. Merritt is Associate Professor and Canada Research Chair, Tier 2, at Canada's Guelph University and head of the Turetsky Lab. Studying Arctic carbon cycles, northern fires, soils, and peatlands, she is the author or co-author of almost 200 peer-reviewed papers. From Guelph, Ontario, Merritt Turetsky, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thanks so much, Alex. Well, let's start with some basic facts. How much of the northern hemisphere is frozen year-round? That's right. So permafrost refers to these soils or earth materials that remain frozen for consecutive years. And we know that it underlies quite a large extent of the northern hemisphere. About one quarter of the land mass in the northern hemisphere is impacted by these permafrost soils. In total, in a country as big as Canada, where I live and work, we think permafrost affects almost 50% of the country. So it's a pretty big landmass being impacted. I had no idea that half of Canada is frozen. So, you know, many people, including my family, refer to Canada as a hockey nation, and I beg to differ. I often refer to Canada as a permafrost nation. It's such an important part of our identity here. Merritt, do we know how much carbon could be contained in that permafrost and how that might compare to our emissions from industrial civilization? We do. So the science on this issue is extremely important to climate policy. And so, you know, there are many scientists around the world, many of them are collaborators of mine that are working furiously to improve the science on this. Let me unpack your question because it's, it's a really good one. First, we are getting a better scientific assessment of just how much carbon is stored in these permafrost regions. This is a difficult issue just because the sheer mass of land that we're talking about and the carbon in these soils has been accumulated over many, many thousands of years. In fact, some of this is from the Pleistocene age. So some of the carbon is actually in, you know, former mammoth biomass. So this is a complicated issue because we have to reconstruct back into time over a a very large mass of land. What we know now, our best estimates from the scientific community, is that permafrost soils today stores about twice as much carbon as is contained in the entire atmosphere. So there's this big pool or stock of carbon sitting in these soils in large part because those soils and materials have been frozen and thus locked away from any kind of decomposition or biological activity, literally in Earth's freezer in the ground. What we need to now understand better is what part of that stock, not going to be all of it, but what fraction of that stock sitting in the ground in the biosphere, is going to be released back to the atmosphere when that permafrost thaws. This is the number that is much less constrained. We we are working on it feverishly, but the numbers are still hotly debated by scientists. If all of the permafrost carbon is released to the atmosphere, this would be a catastrophic change in greenhouse gas concentrations. We know now today from science that that's not going to happen. Some proportion of permafrost carbon will be released, and the question is, how large will that proportion be? Our best guess is about 20% of the stock of permafrost carbon is vulnerable to release, and it's going to be released over a slow period of time, probably hundreds of years. So this is an emission from thawing ground in the Arctic that is globally significant, It's like adding another large industrial nation to the emission scene, another United States or another China. But permafrost carbon release is still smaller than human emissions. It's certainly smaller today, and it likely will remain smaller than human emissions, at least in the near future. 
Why do scientists, if I read this right, on your team warn that greenhouse gas emissions from thawing permafrost could be twice what current models expect? So right now, very few climate models or large-scale models consider permafrost at all. So there are a number of complicated issues in these large-scale models, but the interactions of permafrost, thaw, and carbon release are not well represented in any of these models. What that means is when you read about scenarios from the IPCC, for example, or scenarios used by governments around the world, those climate scenarios for the future do not account for potential release of carbon from a thawing Arctic. There are a handful of models that are starting to simulate or project permafrost and start to account for that. And what those models are doing, so these are some of the most cutting-edge models used by climate scientists and by governments and policymakers around the world. But right now, these models are only considering a very simple type of permafrost thaw. And we call this vertical thaw or active layer thickening. And it's when surface permafrost thaws very gradually and very slowly over time, but it happens everywhere in the Arctic. And we know that this is happening from measurements being collected across field sites all around the Arctic, all around the world. But what I work on and what my colleagues research is a different kind of permafrost thaw, and this happens in a smaller area of the Arctic, but it happens very quickly, and it's abrupt permafrost thaw. It happens only when permafrost contains a lot of ice in it. So permafrost can be frozen anything in the ground, frozen rock, frozen sand. And you can imagine in your mind if frozen rock warms up, it's not really going to have that many consequences. It's not going to affect the ecosystem. It's not really containing any carbon. So there's no big changes happening. But if you thaw and warm up a material that had a lot of ice in it, all of a sudden that water can have really big consequences for the ecosystem. And that's, in fact, what we're seeing. Big areas of forest in ice-rich permafrost terrain thawing out in periods of months to a year and actually very quickly being converted into lakes. So a forest switches to a lake in a very short period of time. These are kinds of the land cover changes associated with permafrost thaw that have big consequences for carbon release, particularly methane emissions. And up until now, these are not being considered in any kind of large-scale models. So that's where our paper came in. We're updating the estimates of permafrost carbon release to include not only slow and steady thaw occurring all around the Arctic, but these hot spots of abrupt change that are happening in a smaller area of land in ice-rich permafrost, but nonetheless are having big consequences for carbon release on a per meter square basis. Well, if we were actually up there, there's some crazy things happening. There's some new almost canyons opening up and and, uh, drunken forests where you have forests falling over and small lakes or ponds appearing across, I know, Siberia, just suddenly a landscape dotted with small little lakes and ponds. Could you talk to us about the unstable nature of frozen lands known as Yadoma? Absolutely. So Yadoma or Yedema is a really interesting historical deposit of permafrost, and it's very rich in ice and in carbon. And I guess this is a really important point, and Yadoma soils really drives this point home. Ice-rich permafrost is very vulnerable to these kinds of sudden landscape changes that you've just covered, and it also tends to be associated with high carbon densities. So this is carbon that used to be in the atmosphere, and it was drawn out of the atmosphere by life living and breathing and respiring and building biomass in the surface of these ecosystems long, long ago. We're talking about Pleistocene grasslands and mammoths roaming those grasslands. 
during the Pleistocene, and those organisms died, and their biomass and its carbon in that biomass was folded into these layers of permafrost. So Yodoma is this old permafrost remnant from this very productive period, almost a grassland steppe type environment in, in what is now the Arctic. And it contains a lot of carbon. Today, these areas are sitting in pretty poorly drained areas. Uh, there's big pockets of Yodoma soils in Siberia, as you mentioned. There's also pockets in other places. For example, Alaska has large regions of Yodoma soils. So we know that these are soils that are very vulnerable. They're, they're currently frozen, but they're starting to experience abrupt thaw at rates faster than what we've seen in the past. And there's a lot of carbon sitting in those soils just waiting to be rotted, literally rotted by microbial communities once those soils warm up. So they're not able to rot now because the temperatures are too cold when the permafrost is in its frozen state. But once it starts to warm up, there's a lot of very yummy carbon for those decomposers and, you know, that temperature constraint on decomposition is lifted, we can see high carbon emissions from these areas in two forms of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and also methane. In 2012, I recorded your co-author Charles Colvin's presentation to the American Academy of Science in Vancouver, and then I interviewed Professor Antoni Lukowitz. But my first impression was that in North America, the study of permafrost back then was a relatively small group of scientists. I was the only journalist in the room. It wasn't a hot topic. And that was during the time of Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper, who had defunded climate change research. Has Arctic research, and particularly into the permafrost, improved in Canada since? It has. There have been great improvements. There are now networks. Uh, and groups of scientists, both internationally and within the national confines of Canada, uh, working together. And that's the key. Researchers who focus on the Arctic work in very remote locations. It's very difficult work to do. Uh, we often spend lots of time walking through difficult terrain, hauling equipment through difficult terrain. And so you end up studying patches of land and, and understanding it really well. And if I can gather my data and combine it with researchers working in other field locations around the Arctic, then we create a network of information that has greater power than the sum of its parts. And that is scientific knowledge generation through synthesis. And, and that is, in fact, what we are doing so about 10 years ago or so, I was one of a handful of scientists that formed a group that you probably have heard of called the Permafrost Carbon Network. And we started with a group of colleagues, and Charlie Coven was one of them. And it grew from there. Over the last 10 years, our network has grown to be a group of over 250 scientists. We all work together. And these scientists, these active members of the Permafrost Carbon Network, come from more than 24 countries. So this shows that this issue of permafrost change and permafrost carbon dynamics is of interest far beyond just the Arctic nations alone. Are Russian scientists involved in this field as well? They are. Now, there is a long and rich history of measuring permafrost change here in Canada, also in Alaska, also in Russia. Canadian scientists and American scientists tend to publish in the same journals, and obviously English is a language of choice for that work. There's a tremendous amount of useful information that is published in Russian journals in a language that we can access but is difficult for us to access. So that is taking time. Uh, but we have many Russian colleagues who are assisting with that, trying to pull as much historical information out of those journals as possible so that we can combine it with what we're collecting today. 
This is Radio Ecoshock. I'm your host, Alex Smith. With us is the scientist Merit Turetsky from Canada. She just led a new comment in the journal Nature titled, Permafrost Collapse is Accelerating Carbon Release. Merit, why did you and your co-authors think it was important to raise these questions in one of the most prominent scientific journals, Nature? We felt it was important for a number of reasons. One is sentiment across places like North America on public sentiment on climate change is changing. So more Americans and Canadians in the public today believe that anthropogenic climate change is happening and will affect them in the future than ever before. So we feel that it's our obligation to continue to talk about climate change to represent northern ecosystems and northern communities. We have the great fortune of working in places that most Canadians and most Americans will never see for themselves. These northern systems are on the front lines of climate change. They are experiencing climate change at rates three to four times faster than anywhere else on Earth. And we are experiencing that because we see the consequences. It's impacting our data. It's impacting our field infrastructure, our field locations. So we are literally seeing these changes happen before our very eyes. We want to talk about that to the public. Number two, most of the scientific community, even other climate experts, know about permafrost, they know about permafrost thaw, but they may only know about one type of permafrost thaw, that slow and steady, gradual permafrost thaw that is being incorporated into some large-scale models. Few people are aware of these abrupt changes that can occur in ice-rich permafrost. We know these impacts. We study these impacts. We felt it was important to communicate this to the scientific community, and also to the IPCC, who are releasing a special report later this year focusing on changing oceans and changing cryosphere dynamics. And certainly permafrost is a big part of the cryosphere. So this is an important time for the IPCC also to be aware of the complexities of permafrost thaw. Could greenhouse gases from thawing permafrost become a serious positive feedback loop where warming creates more gases that lead to more warming? It absolutely will. And I think our latest study really reinforces that this will be an important issue to consider in our climate system in the future. And it's funny because scientists use the term positive feedback to represent this self-reinforcing loop where climate change feeds in on itself. And and you you outlined that self-reinforcing loop quite well. But when the public hears the term positive feedback, they say, hey, it must be good news. It's positive, right? So what scientists really should be doing is describing not not using the term positive feedback, but we need to talk about this as a potential amplifier or a self-reinforcing loop. Again, exactly what you said, we have warming that's causing permafrost to thaw and release ancient carbon to the atmosphere, where that carbon is triggering more warming, which causes more thaw, which causes more release of ancient carbon, and so on and so on. We get into this feedback loop where climate change is reinforcing itself. Our models represent some examples of these self-reinforcing loops, but they do not represent these well in the Arctic, and they certainly do not represent them well when it comes to permafrost. So until our models can project these complexities in the climate system in a, a more nuanced way, we need to continue to gather data and you know, empirical information from our observations so that models can start to really understand that behavior. Because models, while no model is perfect and no modeling community would ever claim that our climate models are perfect, they are our 
only tool, and they are a good tool for making projections of our climate into the future. And in fact, our models have done a pretty good job describing the kinds of climate change that have happened over the last few decades. In your article, you do talk about some steps that should be taken, and it sounded to me, it kind of reminded me of a military project that happened in the Arctic during the Cold War, which was the construction of the dew line measuring stations to watch for missiles coming over the Arctic. But in this case, you're asking for a major investment in monitoring Arctic emissions. What should be done? I think there's a number of really important gaps in our understanding. There are just such limited field locations around the Arctic where change is being measured. And when I say change, I mean change in the ground, in the permafrost itself, but also change in the consequences of thaw, which is one of those consequences is carbon release. There are new tools being developed that can use aircraft data and satellite data to help us project carbon emissions. And so we don't necessarily need to be on the ground anymore in different locations in the Arctic to make these measurements. We can use aircraft and other kinds of technology that can gather data over much larger areas more quickly. So these offer a lot of hope for gathering more scientific evidence and information useful for getting these feedbacks and and cycle loops into our models. We also need some really basic data. So I often say that the fate of permafrost carbon rests on ground ice. That is a key variable. How much ice is stored in permafrost? It sounds like such a simple variable to measure, and yet it is actually quite a difficult thing to actually quantify because you have to drill down deep into the permafrost to get those measurements. But the military has been collecting ground ice measurements for decades. Construction companies and consulting companies in the north, working on pipelines, working on road development in the north, they have been collecting this information to figure out where roads should be placed. We need to get that data, those data, off of the computers of consulting firms, off of old hard drives, out of old filing cabinets. And we need to get those data into the hands of scientists so that we can actually use it to improve our predictions for the North. And this is important not just for understanding carbon and carbon emissions. It's important for understanding how people will live in the Arctic in the future. The Arctic right now is livable because of frozen conditions. People travel across frozen soils. They depend on sea ice. They depend on permafrost as the backbone of their livelihoods. And climate change is taking away those backbones. It's going to require a totally different way of living and building in the north in a life without permafrost and in a life without sea ice. In other permafrost news, Dr. Yaroslav Obu and colleagues from several countries have just released a new map of permafrost. Have you had a chance to look at that yet? I have. It's a great new product, and it's one that I know is quickly being assimilated into all sorts of modeling projections, including trying to understand permafrost change, trying to understand its impacts on carbon release, trying to understand its impact on infrastructure. It also speaks to the fact that it's very difficult to make predictions about where permafrost is, and that is step number one. If we want to understand how permafrost is going to change, we need to understand where it is today, and these are really difficult data to come by. So these new advancements are really fine-tuning what had been a previously old data set that everyone was relying on. So these are really good advancements for the entire scientific community. Merit Tretsky, will you be attending the Arctic Futures 2050 conference in September in Washington? I hope to. So I am part of SEARCH, which is a U.S. multi-agency funded 
organization that is helping to drive that workshop and that meeting. I am part of the Permafrost Action Team, and we are going to have exhibits. We are going to have poster presentations, and we will be working with policymakers and other attendees at that meeting to help ensure that our measurements and our ongoing synthesis activities are best taken up by policymakers because that's the goal. Every scientist wants to have an impact. We want to make sure that our data can be used effectively, not only by the public, but also by policymakers. And so that meeting, I think, will be a really important opportunity for cross-dialogue so that scientists also understand what is needed from policymakers and vice versa, how we can talk about permafrost in a way that can be readily understood by policymakers. Okay, your Twitter handle is Queen of Peat, and you've participated in numerous studies about Arctic peatlands. Why? What is the attraction of that for you? I'm fascinated by these ecosystems because most people avoid them in the Arctic. Many scientists will walk for kilometers to avoid peatlands because they're very difficult to traverse. They're the kind of ecosystems where you need hip waders and little rubber dinghies to get across, but they are fascinating systems. So these are poorly drained systems that cover much of the Arctic, huge areas of Canada and Siberia and Alaska. The water simply, it's so flat, the water can't go anywhere, so it pools up on the landscape. And what we get as a result are these gorgeous wetland habitats. They accumulate these thick layers of peat. And peat is this legacy of carbon, again, that used to be in the atmosphere but has been drawn out largely because of plant growth, plants growing and then dying and being buried and incorporated into this peat layer over time. There's quite a lot of peat that is frozen into permafrost. So not all peat is frozen in permafrost, but a lot of it is. So these two issues overlap with one another conceptually in terms of thinking about carbon that's stockpiled in the biosphere that's vulnerable to climate change that could get re-released to the atmosphere. Not only is peat carbon being thawed out as a result of permafrost change, but it's also burning as a result of drier conditions and and warmer conditions and changing wildfire cycles. So our peat in the north has been this really important legacy of old carbon. It's been stockpiled away for hundreds to thousands of years, but because the Arctic is changing so quickly, it's really being barraged by a number of different disturbances, permafrost thaw, wildfire, just drought in general, warmer conditions and drier conditions. And uh, I'm really fascinated by when the past catches up and influences our future. And these truly are legacies of the past. You left out the horror for me, the bugs, but let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They certainly bite you. Merritt, as we wrap up here, you're also the mother of three. Do you personally worry about your kids' future as the climate shifts? I do. I live in a region in southern Ontario where we are surrounded by water. And, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, natural disasters and extreme weather events uh, to worry about. And, you know, I think many Canadians feel the same way. We know climate change is happening. We know that there's a human contribution to climate change, and we know things are going to get bad. But we are relatively protected from some of the worst impacts from climate change. And I worry as my children grow and disperse across the country that they will have spent a big chunk of their time in a very naive location. We need to be looking out for our most vulnerable populations. And that are, that includes the North, but it includes other places around the world where, you know, economic class becomes a, a, an important issue. Access to clean water becomes an issue. Food insecurity becomes an issue. So for me, climate change is, is what I study, climate change in the North in particular, but I really feel strongly that this is a social justice issue. Some of our most vulnerable human populations are going to be impacted the first, 
And in fact, we're already seeing that in the Arctic and in island nations around the world. And that is something that both inspires me and depresses me at the very same time, because we have a chance to act now. My kids believe so strongly in climate change that they make decisions every day about walking to school, biking to school, and they talk about saving the North as a result. And if we can all just have that attitude, if we can all change our behavior in small ways every single day and in big ways by influencing parents and how parents vote, then we maybe can stave off the worst consequences of climate change. But we only have the next few years to do that. And after our window of the next decade, things will simply be too far along in terms of human emissions to roll it back. So if we act now, we have a chance. Uh, We can't stave off all climate change impacts, but we can maybe prevent the worst from happening. What I fear the most is that through our inactions today, we are leaving the worst problems to the next generation, and that simply would be a, a tragedy. From Canada, we've been speaking with scientist Merit Turetsky. You can find links to the science we talked about in my show blog at ecoshock.org. Merit, thank you so much for contributing to our knowledge here on Radio Ecoshock. Thank you, Alex. You're listening to Ecoshock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org.